here be just relay some facts, whether they're new or antique. So just sit back and relax. It's time for What's Up This Week. Hello, and welcome to What's Up This Week, your weekly dose of history, facts, and trivia from University Branch Library. This week, we're looking back at the groundbreaking film, which seamlessly combines live action with hand-drawn animation. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was released on June 22, 1988. Loosely based on the Gary K. Wolf novel, Who Censored Roger Rabbit, the film takes place in a 1947 Los Angeles where humans and cartoon characters coexist and follows Eddie Valiant, portrayed by Bob Hoskins, a private investigator tasked with proving that Roger Rabbit did not murder the head of the Acme Corporation. In order to flesh out Toontown, producer Steven Spielberg made agreements with multiple animation studios, allowing characters like Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny to inhabit the same world as Betty Boop, Droopy Dog, and Woody Woodpecker. Terry Gilliam was offered the chance to direct, but turned it down, finding the project too technically challenging. He later called the decision, quote, pure laziness on my part. I completely regret that decision. Robert Zemeckis would end up being hired, hot off the success of Back to the Future. Animation veteran Richard Williams was placed in charge of the animated sequences. Together, Zemeckis and Williams set out to break all the rules for combining animation and live action. In one scene, Eddie Valiant charges into a room handcuffed to Roger Rabbit and, on the way in, knocks his head against a low-hanging lamp, causing it to sway and the light source to move throughout the scene. This meant that the animators had to work extra hard in getting the shading and the position of the shadows just right. It's something that most people wouldn't consciously notice, but it helps to make the film's world feel real. The phrase, bumping the lamp, has taken on the meaning of going the extra mile and paying attention to every detail. Who Framed Roger Rabbit grossed $329 million worldwide and won three Academy Awards, including Best Visual Effects. The film sparked a new excitement for animation, both classic and modern, and helped to pave the way for the renaissance of Disney animation, which would kick off next year with the release of The Little Mermaid. That's it for me. What do you have for us this week, James? Appreciate it, Daniel, and hola to you all out there. Pearl S. Buck was one of the most prolific writers of her time. Over the course of her existence, she authored dozens upon dozens of books, many of them pertaining to Asian history and culture. Soon after her birth on June 26, 1892, Buck went with her Presbyterian missionary parents to live in Zhejiang, China. She spent much of her childhood there learning Chinese, specifically Mandarin. Her life was enveloped by the land's people and rich history. As a child, she was taught by her mother and a Chinese tutor. Eventually, she went to a boarding school in Shanghai. She returned to the States to attend college before going back to China to teach. In 1930, she published her first fiction book called East Wind, West Wind, which focuses on a Chinese woman named Kui Lan and the many changes she and her family undergo. The next year, her most notable novel, The Good Earth, about a Chinese peasant and his slave wife was released to critical acclaim. It also received the Pulitzer Prize and was adapted for stage and screen. The Good Earth is part of a trilogy of novels, the second being Sons, while the third is titled A House Divided. In the succeeding years, Buck authored many other novels, including China Sky, Peony, The Hidden Flower, and The Imperial Woman. Her book, The Eternal Wonder, was published posthumously in 2013. Perla Spock was a substantial scribe and activist. She used her first-hand experience and education to create a stronger, more detailed understanding of foreign people and foreign places, which made her works as monumental as her life. To learn more about Buck and to read books by her, Check out any of these library titles.
All right, Megan, what is this week's weird thing? Hi there. This week's weird thing is that June 21st is International Yoga Day. On this day, we celebrate the practice of yoga and all of the benefits it brings to people every day. Yoga has been around for thousands of years and it originated in India. The purpose is to connect the mind, body, and soul and to achieve enlightenment. There are many different styles of yoga, more than 100 in fact. A few of the more well-known styles of yoga include Hatha Yoga, Vinyasa Yoga, Bikram Yoga, Prenatal Yoga, and Yin Yoga. In Western culture, yoga is largely regarded as a form of exercise and relaxation with little to no inclusion of the spiritual elements, depending on the instructor. Indeed, despite its deep roots in religious practices, yoga has become a part of pop culture here in the States, and attending yoga classes is considered somewhat trendy. You can even find special classes of kitten yoga or baby goat yoga if you try. And we sure do love yoga pants, whether we intend to do yoga or just run to the grocery store. Yoga for fitness is considered to be a light form of exercise. It can be very beneficial for both your physical and mental health. It increases flexibility, strength, and balance while relieving stress, anxiety, and some body aches. It's done wonders for my lower back pain and my mental health. If nothing else, it helps to take some time out of the day for yourself and get some good stretches in. To celebrate International Yoga Day, sign up for a yoga class or practice on your own in your living room or your backyard. Already familiar with yoga? Tell a friend or come up with your own flow of movements. Orphan County Libraries has a lot of books and DVDs about the history of yoga and how to practice many different styles of it, available for you to check out. And we've got something for all skill levels. Thank you for watching. Be sure to join us again next week for more facts and trivia from University Branch Library.